In the next 18 minutes, I will tell you six stories that will seem unrelated. But if you pay close attention, you will see a silver lining that gets you to one story about life choices. And the difference between being the master of these choices or their slave. Story number one. Exactly one year ago, after about one and a half years of high Romanian politics, I was back in London with a very difficult family situation and an even more complicated financial one. With 200 pounds in my bank account, I had to do something I hadn't done in a while, which was writing my CV and looking for a job. My CV looks good on the surface of it. I graduated with a master's from Harvard University. I have an MBA from MIT. I worked for McKinsey in New York, and I worked for JP Morgan in London. But that is the face of it. That is what you see. Behind each line, there are a lot of humbling moments. Do you know how many times I had to apply to colleges in the US before one accepted me? Well, I applied to 24, and I graduated top of my class at Brukenthal uh, High School in Sibiu. I attended, international, uh, attended National Olympics in Physics, and only one university out of 24 accepted me. I was so desperate to get into a college in the United States that I even applied to a wonderful little college called Mount Holyoke in southern Massachusetts, Sadly, it was an all-women's college. <laughs> but humbling moments like this kept repeating. It wasn't the only one. And after graduating from my MBA, I, I got a job, as I said, in New York, working for McKinsey. Things went well. Eventually, I started managing teams. And four and a half years down the line, I was told that the world is open. I can do anything I want. So I said, well, that's great. So I took a year off, a sabbatical, to discover myself. After the end of the year, I ended up in London knowing that every company will come to me looking to hire me. Big mistake. Nobody did. For nine months, I did whatever it took to pay rent. And that was the London rent. But this is how all you see is after nine months, I got a call from Takis Yorgakopoulos, the head of strategy at JP Morgan, who offered me a job. What you see on my CV is just one line saying, JP Morgan. Story number two. Anu was one of the sharpest analysts I had at JP Morgan. She was from Nigeria, she had come to London, when she was six with her parents. And while working on a parallel team, she told me, I get no appreciation. I work very, very hard and I get no appreciation. Meanwhile, there are other analysts who work less and they get by. I'm going to do what they do. I'm going to lower a bit my standards. What's the point of it all? I think this is the question for all of us. But how much of our being at our best is the outside appreciation, and how much of it is it part of who we are? Do you get to see the silver lining yet? If not, we can keep going. Story number three. This story has two parts. Do I look like a rock star to you? Well, there was a time in my life when I felt like one. I did feel like a rock star and it will never happen again. I was the bassist in the, in, uh, the rock band of my high school, the Brook Band. I remember 
the balconies in the concert halls, they were thundering and they were shuddering with fans. We felt like we were the Beatles and the Rolling Stones in one. And after one of these iconic concerts, one very close friend, Christy, came to me and he said, look, I really love you guys. I really love the Brook Band. I like Dan, the, lead, the leader of the band. He sings, he has a guitar with six strings and he goes crazy on it. Women love him. What I don't understand is you. You have a four-string guitar, and even that you just pluck with two fingers. You don't sing, and I barely hear you. So I told him he should take visual arts, he should forget about music, he's tone deaf. But I thought back about those moments, and often in my life, I played the bass. I was in the background, making sure that the, rhythm, that the rhythm was there, that we could keep the rhythm, and that the team would march at the same tune. However, importantly, I made sure that the bands I played in, albeit being playing the bass, they were good bands. The second part of the story, It was in 2006, and I was at that time working for McKinsey. I remember being at the W Hotel in New York, preparing for a gala, when um, my manager at the time, Jonathan, came in. I had not finished the financial model for the client, so I was still working on it. So Jonathan saw my shirt on a chair, unironed yet. So he took it and ironed it. Jonathan is now the, one of the leading directors in the Canada office of the firm. And I have no doubt that if he s was in the similar situation, seeing the shirt on a chair, he would take it and iron it. Jonathan understood how to use the moment and what decision is most critical in that very moment. What is the highest value that he can add in that very moment? Are you still with me? Should we go for coffee? No? Story number four. The chocolate flag. Also known as the Swiss flag. So, how often does Switzerland show up in the news? Not, not very often. But when they do, an avalanche that starts in the Alps can bury houses in Romania. What do I mean by that? On January 15, 2015, Swiss National Bank unpegged the Swiss franc from the euro. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of mostly Europeans saw their mortgages go through the roof. They lost their homes, they started protesting in the streets against governments who couldn't protect them. And they had to ask themselves a question. How come the decision that a young central banker makes somewhere between the sleepy town of Berna and Zürich affects people thousands of miles away in ways that were never anticipated and irreversibly so? Story number five. The Swiss flag was easy, but what is this? This is a gas canister, a petrol canister. And what it symbolizes for me is one of the most important negotiations in the world, the setting of the oil price by the OPEC Council. For the past 10 years, I have been teaching at a university in Sibiu, the summer business school, where I always brought in an oil pricing exercise. So what, what, what happened during the oil pricing exercise? I had 30 students that I would divide into groups 
one team negotiating another team, another team negotiating another team, so three simultaneous games. The role of the game was to negotiate, to create trust, to create collaboration, and hence receive a payoff from setting the price of oil. Unavoidably, 10 years on, every single year, there was one team of teams, right? so two teams each, that would create great payoffs, and at the same time, some that would create awful payoffs. It was the same room, same air. What were the ingredients for good collaboration, for good outcomes, and for bad outcomes? So number six. I'd like to come back to my JP Morgan days and introduce you to Al. Al is a 17-year-old high school student from Newcastle who wears dreadlocks. He's the person whom you would never see on a trading floor of JP Morgan. He was one of the 50 students that we would take in as part of the Social Mobility Foundation. There were students who were coming from the poorest families in the UK, but they were outstanding in terms of academic records. These people, we had no doubt, could get any job at JP Morgan based on their intelligence. However, the challenging bit was the norms and conventions of their world versus the ones of the world in investment banking. And it was our role to negotiate between these norms, to bridge these norms. Let me give you an example. To the bankers, these students were like cups without a handle. They couldn't grab them, they couldn't understand them. These kids didn't have the five-year story. What does that mean? You know, what are you going to do in five years? Where are you going to be in five years? They did not function that way. They didn't have a narrative. They didn't have hobbies. Yeah? All the other interns, they had hobbies and they could talk at length about these hobbies. One of them, when he was invited for coffee to discuss careers, he said, I don't drink coffee. He did not understand that this wasn't an invitation to the consumption of a liquid, but rather a convention of going on the side and talking. So when Al came to me and told me that he got a job on the trading floor of JP Morgan, he got a job that everybody would have died to have. There's hundreds of people who apply for these jobs. They're extremely prestigious. And yet he wasn't sure whether he could take it. He knew that he would need to cut his dreadlocks if he had to be there. His decision was not about dreadlocks. It was about conformism versus authenticity. It was about free will versus obedience. So let's review. Story number one, the two sides of the CV, the old woman versus the young woman. I'm sure you've seen this before. Light and darkness, yin and yang. We are success and failure at the same time, but we know that. I think f overcoming failures give us resilience. Successes give us hope and confidence. But more than that, for me, failures have been the key ingredient to transformations. I wouldn't have done the things I mentioned I did had I not had to grapple with deep failures. Moreover, within these failures, you can find bliss. And last year, for example, there was the time that I could spend with my children in unexpected ways. Story number two. Anu receiving no appreciation. You see, Anu was in a job that would be followed by another one, and yet another one, and another one. Every time you try to lower your standards to punish an organization, to teach a lesson, you sink 
deeper and deeper as options shrink and you become the slave of your choices. Story number three, me as a rock star and Jonathan, my boss. You see, sometimes all it takes is to lower your ego, to know when it's okay to play the second violin, to play the bass on the band. That can lead to the success of the team. Story number four, the Swiss flag. We can no longer say that we act in separation. Decisions that happen in Mongolia can affect people in Romania or in London in unanticipated ways. And the choices that a person makes in a small town in Berna can impact me in ways that I never anticipated. Story number five. Choose your reality. We know it's hard to establish trust and to re-establish it. But choose the people you want to establish trust with. Somebody said, can I teach a turkey to climb a tree? Yes. But I'd rather hire a squirrel. Choose the squirrels and never disappoint them. The last story. L, what are you willing to give up to get what you want? What stories are you willing to leave behind? What doors are you willing to close to step through the next door? See, all these stories are about my choices. I am Anu and I'm Al, I'm Anuel. <laughs> and so are you. And why are we doing all this? Happiness, I think. We heard that happiness is the expectation versus what we can achieve. The only choice you can make is where do you set the expectation and where do you set your accomplishment. And that is a choice you need to master. Thank you. <laughs>